criminals who were killed in court. These are the times when the court transformed into a battleground of unexpected emotions. From a suspect drinking poison to a mob attacking a criminal, things are about to get wild. Just like this time when a prime suspect was shown his true place, Klaus Grabowski. So Klaus Grabowski was a man who was the prime suspect for violating people and taking their lives. But guess what? He isn't the main character of the story. The picture you're looking at is of Marianne Bachmeier, the pivotal character of this tragic tale. Marianne was raised in a conservative family, often abused by family members. It's true, this chick had a traumatic childhood. To make things worse, she became pregnant at the age of 18 by her boyfriend. What's more, she was once again violated shortly before the birth of her second child who was sadly put up for adoption as an infant. But it didn't stop there. Marianne became pregnant for the third time at the age of 22. And Marianne's third child, Anna, was born at this time. Marianne decided to raise her alone. As a result, this person named Bachmeier took Anna to work at the pub. And she was said to never feel a need to rush back home after her regular hours behind the bar. Marianne was aware of her problematic lifestyle and wanted to put Anna up for adoption. Some friends later said that she treated Anna like a little adult and from a young age expected her to take care of many things on her own. One day, the mother and daughter had a fight and the eight-year-old went to the school, but she never returned home. That's when all eyes were drawn towards Klaus Grabowski, to which Grabowski stated that the eight-year-old seduced him and wanted money from him. Also, he said Anna attacked him and whatever he did was all out of self-defense. When the suspect came to the courtroom, things took a turn. Marianne took a gun with her to the courtroom and what she did next was insane. Marianne took justice into her own hands and that was the end of Grabowski. The distraught mother was in prison. However, she only lived for a few years before succumbing to pancreatic cancer. Marianne was buried with her eight-year-old daughter. But the most chilling part is a statement that she made after firing her weapon. She said, I did it for you, Anna. May they rest in peace. But this is just the beginning of a really wild list of cases. Just like this next one, which is a love story that took a dark turn. David Paradiso. Here comes a whirlwind romance that ended in a chilling crime. After just a few weeks of dating bliss, David Paradiso's love affair took a deadly detour. In a shocking move, he compelled his own mother to keep on driving while he put a knife through his girlfriend's neck and left her lifeless on the road. But wait, Paradiso's dear mom spilled the truth, revealing that everything seemed peachy until that fateful day. However, Paradiso initially playing the self-defense card quickly flip-flopped on his story. He said he had to make the first move before she could do it. But here's another start to the story. David Paradiso later stated that she deserved to die and it was intentional. But that's where the climax begins. David Paradiso, who was on trial, ended up charging towards the Superior Court Judge Cinda Fox. Yes, you heard me, the judge. It was unclear what means he used to put an end to the judge. But Fox, who was taken to the hospital, was being treated in the emergency room and was reported to be in good condition. The nature of her injuries were not disclosed. The Lodi newspaper reported that Paradiso's mother said that after the shooting, that her family had tried to warn jailers about two weeks ago that her son had a 9mm and he had been carrying it into the courtroom. In defense, Paradiso later testified that he was suffering from paranoia after taking meth before the encounter with his girlfriend. But this leaves us with an unanswered question. What about the judge then? Can his actions be excuses because of the effect of illicit substances? If you thought this was crazy, the next one is even more controversial. And this time, the mystery lies with the convict, Slobodan Praljak. You see, Slobodan Praljak, the Bosnian Croat war general, lived a life as complex as the war-torn era he found himself embroiled in. Born on January 2nd, 1945, Praljak was not just a military man. His tale weaves through engineering, television, and even the theater. The drama in Praljak's life escalated when he voluntarily joined the Croatian Armed Forces during the tumultuous Croatian War of Independence. But Praljak's story took a dark turn. Accusations of violations of the laws of war, crimes against humanity, and breaches of the Geneva Conventions during the Croat-Bosniak War followed him. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavian didn't turn a blind eye. In 2004, he was indicted, and Praljak, like a character in a gripping plot, voluntarily surrendered. Fast forward to 2013, the ICTY delivered its verdict, and Praljak was found guilty of war crimes against the Bosniak population. Kovic was responsible as a participant in a JCE, 
Alongside five other Bosnian Croat officials, he faced the consequences, a 20-year sentence. But the climax was yet to come. In a jaw-dropping courtroom scene in November 2017, Slobodan Pralcek, facing the appeal judgment against him, unleashed a theatrical protest. With an air of defiance, he declared, Judges, Slobodan Pralcek is not a war criminal. With disdain, I reject your verdict. Then, in a shocking twist, he theatrically consumed what he claimed was poison, sending shockwaves through the courtroom. Stop, please. Uh, please sit down. The presiding judge hurriedly suspended the proceedings as chaos ensued. Emergency services rushed Praljak to the HMC hospital, but the tale didn't end there. Dutch authorities treating the courtroom as a crime scene launched an investigation into the sensational incident. In a final act of secrecy, Praljak's body was quietly cremated in Zagreb during a private ceremony leaving lingering questions and an air of intrigue surrounding the demise of this controversial figure. All right, folks, buckle up, because this next incident has an eerie twist to its tale. Brian Nichols. Okay, trust me, this one's got all the elements of a Hollywood blockbuster, but with a chilling real-life twist. So picture this, Atlanta 2005. Nichols, a dude with a rap sheet, is on trial for violating a female and shooting. But get this, during the trial, he pulled a daring move, overpowered a sheriff's deputy, and went on a full-blown rampage. Yeah, you heard it right. Straight out of the courtroom chaos into the streets. Now, you'd think the guy would lay low, right? Nah, not Nichols. He went on a wild spree, breaking into homes, carjackings, you name it. And here's the kicker. He's got a hostage in tow, a federal agent named Cynthia Hall. It was like a real-life action movie playing out of the streets in Atlanta. The whole city was on high alert as Nichols continued his crazy run. The manhunt was on. Helicopters buzzing overhead, cops scrambling. It was like a scene out of every crime drama. But this is for real. Nichols was no small-time crook. He was playing for keeps. Now, hold on to your hats because it gets even crazier. Nichols ended up in the apartment of Ashley Smith an unsuspecting woman who became an unlikely hero. She was just a regular gal, trying to make it through life, and suddenly she was face to face with a wanted man. But here's where things take a surprising turn. Instead of panicking, Smith did the unthinkable. She talked to Nichols, humanizing the situation. She shared her own struggles, her battles with addiction, and guess what? It worked. Nichols, the big bad criminal, started to unravel. It was like a psychological thriller unfolding right there in that tiny apartment. As dawn broke, something incredible happened. Nichols, the guy who had the whole city holding its breath, surrendered. Can you believe it? And get this, he asked Smith to call the police. Talk about a plot twist. Believe me, the gossip mill went into overdrive. Was it Stockholm Syndrome? Did Nichols see a glimmer of redemption in Smith's story? The whole city was busting with theories and questions, trying to wrap their head around this mind-bending saga. Oh man, Nichols' trial became a spectacle. But the whispers didn't die down. The city wanted answers. How did the courtroom incident spiral into a full-blown manhunt? And how on earth did a regular woman like Ashley Smith become the key player in this gripping drama? In the end, Nichols was convicted. But the story doesn't fade away. It's etched into Atlanta's history as one of the most bizarre and captivating criminal tales. It's a reminder that truth is often stranger than fiction. And in the heart of chaos, sometimes the most unexpected heroes emerge. But if you think that was crazy, this next story is even crazier. Michael Marin, a former Wall Street hotshot living the high life with all the riches, rare books, and art you could dream of. Marin was the man who seemed to have it all. He had the kind of life everyone was jealous of. But, and there's always a but in these stories, things took a nosedive into the dark and scandalous. Flashback to 2012, and Marin was drowning in financial chaos. Debts piling up, and his fancy Arizona mansion on the line. Now, most folks would tighten their belts or maybe downsize, but not for our man Michael. Oh no, he hatched a plan that wouldn't be out of place in a Hollywood thriller. Hold on to your hats, because Marin decided to burn down his own mansion. Crazy, right? But that's just the beginning. On the night of the fire, he pulled off a Houdini act, escaping the inferno in scuba gear through a window. What was once a tragic accident becomes a web of deceit as investigators start peeling back the layers. What's the grand plan, you ask? Marin wasn't trying to become a real-life firefighter superhero. No, sir. He was gunning for a massive insurance payday by faking his own death. 
the audacity of it all. Now, the gossip around this audacious caper spreads like wildfire. People were hooked, jaws dropping at the sheer craziness of it. A Wall Street big shot turned stuntman? You can't make this stuff up. The whispers echo through the neighborhood, bars, and coffee shops alike. Everyone was wondering how a dude swimming in wealth ends up pulling a move like this. But here's where the story took a sharp turn. The courtroom drama unfolded, and Marin's slick veneer started to crack. The evidence piled up, with arson investigators dropping bombshells. In a courtroom shocker, the man who once oozed affluence and composure got the guilty verdict for arson and insurance fraud. But why did he do it? Was it the allure of quick cash, desperation, or a wild cocktail of both? Marin's tale became a cautionary yarn, a reminder that even the fanciest suits on Wall Street can't predict the crazy twists of life can throw at you. But this is where it gets crazier. Did you see that? Marin fell to his death. Guess he just couldn't take it anymore. But that's not queer enough. Yes, you heard me right. Jonathan Schmitz. Jonathan Schmitz, the unsuspecting average Joe from Michigan, stepped into the Jenny Jones show anticipating a revelation of a secret admirer in March 1995. Little did he know the show had a shocking twist in store. His admirer turned out to be Scott Amadeur, a gay acquaintance, revealed on the grand stage of national television. On screen, Schmitz wore a mask of amusement and flattery, but behind the facade, a tempest of rage brewed. The tantalizing drama continued off camera as Lieutenant Bruce Nail of the Sheriff's Department spilled the behind the scenes tea. Schmitz, assuming a woman was his secret admirer, planted a kiss, only to be rudely awakened with the revelation. Oh, no, she's not your secret admirer. This is Hugh Amadure, a 32 year old introduced by the meddling matchmaker, Donna Riley. The Jenny Jones Show producers, even the puppeteers, spun their own tale, claiming the crush's gender was left tantalizingly open-ended. In the unreleased episode, Schmitz, with an unsettling calm, affirmed his heterosexuality to Amador. The aftermath, however, wasn't the anticipated laughter. It unfolded in the gripping theater of the courtroom, a stage set for justice and retribution. The scandalous court proceedings laid bare the inner turmoil of a man pushed to the brink by an unforeseen revelation. Schmidt's defense played the humiliation card and painted a picture of a crumbling mental state. He surrendered himself after he finished off Scott, but this tragedy showcases society's mirror reflecting the consequences of sensationalized television and the fragile human psyche. In the end, Schmitz faced the music, the consequences of his tumultuous actions forever branding him as the Jenny Jones killer. His defender tried his best to lessen his punishment, but it wasn't called for. Soon, the court saw a tragic turn of events. Schmitz pulled the medal and shockingly pointed it at his own head and shoot. However, he miraculously survived. Last but not least, the tale of a demon who was soon put to his own hell. Aku Yadav. Aku Yadav had terrorized families living in Kasturba Nagar, barging into homes demanding money, shouting threats, and abuse. But it was inappropriate indulgences with the opposite sex that humiliated the community. Residents of Kasturba Nagar say that a victim lived in every other house of the slum. He violated women to control men, ordering his henchmen to drag even girls who were really young to a nearby derelict building to be violated. What's more, Yadav put an end to at least three individuals. He tortured and kidnapped people, invaded homes, and violated more than 40 women and girls. And boy, that was sure barbaric. He bribed the police, giving them money and buying them drinks to convince them to let him continue committing crimes. For many years, Yadav and his associates gang raped women and girls as young as age 10 as a warning to those who resisted him. But one day, Yadav and his men went all the way with a woman 10 days after she gave birth. After what happened to her, the woman committed suicide. She burned to death after dousing herself in kerosene and lighting it. Yadav's gang pulled another woman from her house when she was seven months pregnant. They stripped her down and misused her on the road in public view. Several women who were sent away by the police saying that they're of loose character and that's why they had to face the consequences. Like what? The villager set Yadav's house on fire to which he filed a complaint. The women had enough of him and took it into their own hands. A mob of women took knives and other sharp objects and stuffed chili powder in a napkin. They forced themselves to the courtroom to pierce him with sharp objects. But wait for it. They also chopped off his private parts. 
And what do you know? This led to the death of the demon, Aku Yadav. So, have you heard of this more times when the court drama got as wild as this? Let me know in the comments down below. And also, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. By the way, check the next video right here. It's even better.